All right, moving along to locally advanced triple negative breast cancer, where in recent years, especially with the inclusion of immunotherapy, we've seen the shift towards neoadjuvant treatment based off Keynote 522 regimen. And again, just as a reminder, Keynote 522 regimen is made of carboplatin, paclitaxel, adriamycin, cytoxin, while we continue with pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant, and then we complete a year long of pembrolizumab post-surgery. At SABCS 2024, we also saw that we don't have a clear biomarker in selecting the right patient for chemoimmunotherapy, but this approach has led to pathological complete response and overall survival, so still remains your standard of care. Virginia, when it comes to disease that is two centimeters or lymph node positive disease, your treatment here? I think this is the one place where we actually have a standard therapy. We, we don't really have a lot of argument as to what to do. So I'll give Keynote 5 to 2, complete surgery, after surgery if there is a PCR. I'd likely continue the pembrolizumab unless there's a lot of immune toxicity where I won't because we don't have data that pembro will help in those patients with PCR post-surgery. If we don't have a PCR, then I will combine pembrolizumab with either capecitabine or a lap rib, depending on whether the tumor is germline BRCA positive or not. I will probably also give a lap rib to those few patients that have a PALB2 mutation. We don't have data, but this is another gene in that HRD pathway where we know PARP inhibitors are beneficial. We've seen the data in the metastatic setting. So I will extrapolate from that data and give a lap rib in that population too. Thanks for laying that, Virginia. And truly, the consensus is utilizing Keynote 522 regimen. Now, if the patient is not a candidate for IO, and I can certainly think of some of these patients in my clinic setting, that is severe autoimmune disorder or a transplant patient, in those settings for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, do you still rely on dose-dense ACT or carboplatin plus acetaxel is your preferred approach? I definitely add carboplatin. I think we've seen now a lot of data from several clinical trials, including meta-analyses, suggesting that triple negative breast cancer patients with a stage two plus tumor do get benefit from carbo. So I will add carbo. Now there's a debate whether to do AC followed by T-carbo or T-carbo followed by AC. I'll probably follow the Keynote 522 regimen minus the Pembro. And Rohit, you brought up dose-dense AC when not using immunotherapy, as we have data supporting that dose-dense AC has better outcomes. But with Keno 522 study, AC is given every three weeks. Virginia, in your practice, do you use dose-dense AC when relying on Keno 522 regimen with pembrolizumab? I don't because the schedule ends up becoming a nightmare. You have member <laughs> given every three weeks and the AC given every two weeks. The study was really done with every three-week AC, so I'll give that. Virginia, can I clarify something? You brought up Olaprib. We have updated data from SABCS 2024 on Olympia. We continue to see overall survival benefit here. Do you combine Olaprib with pembrolizumab? I feel very comfortable with that approach with capecitabine and pembrolizumab, but patients with BRCA positive, do you just rely on PARP inhibitor and then come back to immunotherapy? Do you combine both of them? I combine them. We have good safety data. There's a suggestion of synergy between the two. So I feel very comfortable combining those two. Okay. And while we are on that topic, with regards to if the patient is a BRCA mutation positive residual disease, what are your approaches? I would not give capecitabine in those patients. I would give the Olaparib and Pembro. Thanks very much for covering that, Virginia. While we are talking about the Olaparib and capecitabine here, toxicity is diarrhea. With regards to pembrolizumab can cause diarrhea, capecitabine can cause diarrhea. How do you navigate through that when you are treating with a combination itself? Do you taper one or the other, or how do you go about that? So the pembrolizumab-induced diarrhea is very different because it's immuno immunologic right. in nature. You have to add steroids and so forth. What we've seen with Keynote is that the majority of these immune-related toxicities happen in the neoadjuvant setting. If a patient gets to the adjuvant setting without any neoadjuvant IO toxicity, it's unlikely that they will get this. But any doubt, I will do a colonoscopy and biopsies because I need to know what the mechanism between behind the two is before I'm able to treat the patient. If this is not IO related, I don't want to be giving steroids to these patients because then I'm increasing the likelihood of sure. perforations, other, other toxicities as well. Now, the one I, thing that I haven't done yet in the adjuvant setting, unless somebody has toxicity, is use the fixed dose of capecitabine week on, week off. I typically try to do the create X 
2000 milligrams, not 2500 per meter square, but three weeks on, one week off. Once I see toxicity, I will switch to that fixed dose. And while we're talking about capecitabine and how to manage toxicities, another thing when it comes to supportive care is the Voltaren gel that can help with hand foot syndrome, something that I'm starting to use more and more in my practice. Okay, before we switch gears to metastatic disease, low ER PR disease where expression is less than 10%. We often treat these patients as triple negative breast cancer. So a patient who received Keynote 522 regimen, Virginia, do you still consider giving adjuvant endocrine therapy or completing a year of pembrolizumab is good enough? So anybody that has ER more than 0%, I will attempt to give endocrine therapy to. As an example, I just saw a patient in clinic today. She was ER 0, PR 8% and had finished the keynote regimen, had a PCR, came to see me, switched providers, and I said, I'd like to give you endocrine therapy with an AI. She argued with me. I said, let's try it. If you have a lot of toxicity, it's perfectly happy to stop it. I think most of the benefit rose from your chemotherapy. There's some ER positivity there. I'd like to give some endocrine therapy. There's the setting of a lot of these patients potentially needing a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So that's where the issue comes because they're low ER, right? They might need a CDK. What do we do? Do we give immunotherapy and CDK? The answer is no, especially with a bemacyclib. There's actually some data suggesting increased toxicity with ILD. So we don't want to give the Pembro and a bemacyclib. We're going to have to make a decision as to which one to give. Maybe we give the Pembro for the year and then we give the abemacyclib. With the data on RIBO, would you still hold off on RIBO or any CDK4-6 for that matter? It, okay. it is because all of them are associated with ILD at a different extent, but they're all associated with a potential ILD. Thanks for bringing that up because that was not on my radar, but very important now that these CDK4-6 inhibitors are approved in adjuvant settings.